Welcome. This is lecture 12, and this will focus on the infections of the alimentary, otherwise known as gastrointestinal, and genital urinary system. We're going to be dealing with chapters 24 and 27. And a couple of things just to get you started. You want to review the key terms in the glimpse of history. It's going to be a very interesting one, especially how cholera can be something that is known in the past and uh, there are some books out there actually on some of the really rich scientific work that John Snow did uh, in London on it. But also that wherever you have extreme uh, destruction of water lines uh, with possibility of contamination of water lines with sewer lines, whether you're talking about uh, United States or Uganda, whether you're talking about Russia, China, or Yemen, you're going to see the possibility of gastrointestinal diseases. And one of them that's going to be out of control very quickly is cholera. Um, cholera right now is also prevalent as we're talking, and this is being recorded for February of 2018. Sadly, in Yemen, because there is a very serious cholera outbreak out in that area, in part because of the contaminated water supplies and the uh, poor public health system that is there because of the uh, civil war that's going on. Well, moving on. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about the uh, digestive system, otherwise known as gastrointestinal tract or alimentary system. It's one of the body's boundaries with the environment. It is a major route uh, for invasion by microbial pathogens and parasites. When we talk about the anatomy and physiology of the digestive system, you have to think about the process of what's going on here. We have food. We grind the food into small particles to increase the surface area for subsequent chemical breakdown by enzymes and acid, etc. And what's going to happen there is you're going to transport the food through the esophagus to the stomach to initiate treatment with acid and pepsin, pepsin, of course, being the enzyme. You will have to then release the digested stomach contents, which now have had a great decrease in their pH, into the small intestine in a controlled fashion for further breakdown of food molecules. These broken down molecules, so amino acids, we're talking about monosaccharides, we're talking about uh, some simple fatty acids, as well as uh, monoglycerated uh, monoglycerated glycerides, excuse me, and what you're going to have is uh, this mixture. The um, simpler molecules are going to be absorbed by the lining of the small intestine. Anything that's not digestible is moved into the large intestine. Most of the water will be reabsorbed. You will have a fecal mass. 30% of the fecal mass will be bacteria. Some of the other materials of the fecal mass will include things like uh, undigestible fiber, cellulose, okay, hemicellulose, things like that. And then, of course, you have a process to discharge of the waste as feces. When we talk about the divisions of the digestive system, the upper digestive tract will be composed of mouth, salivary glands, esophagus, and stomach. Lower digestive tract will be composed of the intestines, both small and large, as well as the pancreas and liver. When we talk about the organs, and I refer you to figure 24-1, you want to keep in mind to review the infections in each organ, and we're going to go through that in this lecture. The mouth will grind the food. You have to deal with teeth and gums as a site of infection. The salivary glands, which will make a saliva and salivary enzymes, uh, that's another site. The esophagus is a muscular uh, tube that transports via peristalsis the food bolus to the stomach. Rarely do infections occur here, except in situations like AIDS and other immunodeficiencies. Uh, the stomach is a muscular sac-like structure that treats the food material to pepsin, the first enzyme, uh, that real enzyme that's going to do some serious breaking down of the, the food product, and acid. Now, the acid will denature the proteins and begin the protein breakdown. Usually, acids of the stomach kill off most of the pathogens, and we'll show you where there are a few that are able to bypass this. The small intestine is covered with villi, and each villi, if you notice in that micro uh, image there, each of the villi are covered with uh, extensions of the uh, cell membrane, and these are called microvilli. This is basically to increase the absorptive surface area 
of the nutrients that you're going to want to bring in. The small intestine will also release a neutralizing fluid, intestinal juice, and this is going to have a slightly higher pH to help neutralize the acidity of the chyme. This is that material that left the stomach, and it also is now, because it's been soaked with acid, it's going to have a very low pH. Uh, the lining cells shed off at a constant rate uh, in the small intestine, usually about nine days for complete turnover. Nine liters of fluid are reabsorbed along with monosaccharides, amino acids, fatty acids, vitamins, minerals, as I said. The pancreas is going to make uh, enzymes. It will also make a bicarbonate a solution that's mixed with the enzymes, and this will also help reduce the acidity of the chyme. Uh, the liver will produce bile, and it will be stored in the gallbladder. Now, the bile is an emulsifying agent. Uh, helps break down fats into smaller globs so that they can be successfully broken down by lipase, uh, the enzymes that break down lipids. Uh, the liver also plays a critical role in the neutralization and the breakdown of poisons, toxins, and drugs. Okay, and by the way, the bile pigment, which is made from hemoglobin breakdown product, is added uh, to the bile, can back up and enter blood and skin, and that's where you get jaundice, and you saw that as the first caption in the chapter. Now, the, bio, the liver is extremely important also for converting ammonia, a nitrogenous waste, to urea. Urea is water soluble. What it does is that you take two ammonia molecules and carbon dioxide, and by the process of, of uh, enzymes, you will form this nitrogen waste product that's harmless to humans. It's really bad to have just ammonia floating around there because it's going to shift the pH upward. You don't want that. What you do is you make urea, and that's water-soluble and passes out in the urine. Now, you need to be aware of this. The gallbladder stores bile, which we talked about before, but it can become a habitat for pathogens, particularly salmonella typhi. And I refer you over to page uh, 648 about that. You may review this also with um, the YouTube video about typhoid Mary, and you'll understand it clearly. These pathogens can proliferate in the gallbladder, and even though you have an asymptomatic individual, they can be a carrier and pass on the uh, salmonella typhi, the typhoid fever uh, bacteria, uh, whenever they do cooking. <clears throat> the large intestine absorbs much of the water of the feces, and some nutrients are also absorbed in the large intestine. Now, as we move forward, we're going to get into the mouth. The mouth, uh, the, the key area there is the teeth. There are going to be primary, uh, a variety of species that will colonize the mouth, especially the teeth, and they will help to form the dental plaque, which is composed of Streptococcus mutans and other species. Colonization depends on some species creating the environment and then others, which are particularly anaerobic, inhabiting the niches. So in other words, as this plaque is formed, particularly around the gingival crack, uh, crevice area, etc., that's where you're going to have the perfect conditions for anaerobics staying there. Remember that anaerobes and some other species will, of course, take glucose and they will not completely uh, break it down, but rather they will go through fermentation break down uh, the glucose to form lactic acid. And this lactic acid is what will start causing the erosion of the tooth enamel and the dentin. Okay? Now, a couple of other important points. And by the way, if you take a look at that tooth, I just bring it to your attention that you see up the pulp, uh, the root canal, uh, where nerve vein artery is, and you see around there spongy bone, and then, of course, you have, of course, the, the gumphosis, which is the joint there, tooth to jaw. And the gingival crevice area and the gingiva, the gum, are going to be primary areas. We're going to talk about uh, disease in a few minutes. You know, the enamel, which is a very, very hard, tough material. But when it gets eroded away, it's no quick replacement. The dentin, interestingly enough, has a lot of very, very small tubules that will go from the area of where the enamel was to the pulp area. If we talk about the intestine, due to the flushing action of digestive juices, few organisms will live in the upper small intestine, usually some streptococcus, candidia albicans, and lactobacilli. The large intestine is loaded with a whole massive amount of 
uh, an ecosystem. I mean, literally, it's like, wow, he's getting excited about this. Well, you would, because this is the microbiome of the large intestine and um, due in part to the anaerobic and nutrient rich and dark conditions, you're going to have a lot of different organisms. As I mentioned before, one third of the fecal weight is going to be bacteria. Many enterobacteria exist, so you'll find Escherichia, Bacteroides, etc. Also, some bacteria do are involved in the process to make B vitamins, but they can also take carcinogenic agents and make them active carcinogens, nitrates and things like that. Um, and that's where we found out where some food preservatives were not good because they're safe until they hit the, the uh, large intestine. There's also a concept that you need to be very, very aware of, antibiotic-associated diarrhea. This is caused by dysbiosis. In other words, you are going to have a situation where broad-spectrum antibiotics are going to be coming in, used to treat a patient for an illness, but what happens is they also wipe out a lot of the large intestine bacteria, and what takes over instead is Clostridium difficile. This is an anaerobic bacteria that colonizes Normally, it's suppressed by the normal microbiota, but it leads to the formation of pseudomembranous colitis. The toxins will kill the intestinal epithelium, cause patches of pseudomembranes, which are basically made up of dead epithelial cells, uh, inflammatory cells, and clotted blood, and this will be found on the intestinal walls. The uh, end result is fever, abdominal pain, and diarrhea, and you can see an image of that, and we'll go back over it in a bit, but it's on... Uh, Figure 2414. Now, let's start talking about some of these issues here. <clears throat> Dental caries. Now, I want to bring up one other side note here just to keep you aware of this that there are some oral microbiota can enter the bloodstream and cause subacute bacterial endocarditis, resulting in heart attacks. That's why some individuals, if they're immunocompromised, if they're going under some chemo treatment, for example, to even mute down. Uh, an autoimmune disease like lupus or something, they may have to go under sort of a prophylactic antibiotic treatment prior to actually having their teeth cleaned. Um, patients need to communicate this to their dentist that they may be prone to this type of situation. Um, it's not unusual that when individuals undergo um, teeth cleaning, that sometimes the bacteria get loosened, they get back into the bloodstream, and they can trigger a heart attack, okay? Dental caries, as you see, uh, we're gonna talk about this in figure 24.3. The symptoms are severe throbbing pain, discoloration of tooth, the tooth can break during chewing. The main, it's the main reason or main cause for tooth loss. And usually the caries, the decay is far advanced before any symptoms appear. The causative agent are Streptococcus mutans and a, a related species. And basically, they live as biofilms on teeth. They form the lactic acid, which is a byproduct of the metabolism of sugars. The formation of kerogenic plaque, where the bacteria attach the teeth into each other, uh, is the pathogenesis. Sucrose is broken down, and the glucose is polymerized to glucan, which acts as the substrate for the biofilms. As for fructose, this is metabolized to lactic acid. The lactic acid will be available to dissolve the calcium phosphate matrix of the tooth. Okay. Epidemiologically, this is worldwide. Prevention and treatment. Well, since we've seen this increase in sugar in diet, it advances the caries formation. Fluoride does uh, make the tooth enamel harder and more resistant to acid damage. Sealants remove fissures in teeth where bacteria could hide and generate caries. Mechanical tooth brushing can remove bacteria and kerogenic plaque. The treatment may require drilling the caries out, in other words, the damaged uh, tooth part out, and filling the hole with an amalgam or other material. Now, when you think about it today, we don't really see much in the sense of amalgams, which is a mixture of silver and mercury or gold and mercury. That makes the metal very pliable, and then you can pack it into the hole that you've made by removing the uh, caries material, the damaged tooth. We now have other types of acrylics and um, other plastics that basically do the same job without the risk of leaching mercury into the mouth. 
If you go to the next area we're going to be talking about, that's periodontal disease. And this is due to the chronic inflammation of gums and tissues around the roots of the teeth. Now keep this in mind. This also is slow to develop, usually asymptomatic until the disease is well advanced. The individual will be demonstrating bleeding, sensitive gums, bad breath, loosening the teeth. And the active agent is really dental plaque, carogenic or not. The plaque forms in the crevices of the gingiva or in the neck or next to the gum and teeth. And if you remember seeing back in there, you can see the gingival crevice there. And in those areas, that's where you're going to have the buildup of the bacteria, the buildup of the plaque, and the subsequent next steps. Those steps are bacterial products are going to incite an inflammatory response. Anaerobes like poor pri uh, pyromomas, gingivalis, will further the infection, will release toxins and enzymes that accelerate the tissue damage. Teeth lose their support tissue and become weakened and loose. Usually this is a disease that you see with adults older than 35. And there's almost like a direct connection between poor dental health care and the incidence of this type of periodontal disease. The prevention and treatment is basically to avoid the buildup of plaque. Surgery has been required in some advanced cases uh, due to exposed roots and necessary to remove the plaque as well as the calculus. Now, calculus is dental plaque that has now calcium salts incorporated into it. It's also known as tartar. <clears throat> Excuse me. If we move to the next step, which is Vincent's disease, otherwise known as trench mouth or acute necrotizing um, ulcerative gingivitis, ANUG. ANUG is very, very sad. And uh, this is an example of that, that you might see. And what you see in the lower part is some of the causative agents, the treponema, which is a spirochete, along with fusobacterium, Privotella and other aerobes, anaerobes, usually the onset of fever, painful bleeding gums, foul mouth order. Although the exact process is not, a, is not completely certain, death of the tissue, ulceration, and tissue invasion of gums between the teeth are usually what you have. All ages are susceptible. Usually this is in part due to poor mouth care, mental nutrition, and immunodeficiency. Uh, prevention, daily removal of plaque and professional cleaning of the calculus. Antibiotic treatment followed by excessive removal of plaque and calculus. And I can't stress this enough. You see in the upper part there, you can see some of the beginning of, of uh, not only just the red inflamed gums, the loss of the gum line. And so you see this receding gum line with the teeth there. And just look at this. With a glucose rinse, you can watch how the pH plummets from just about seven down to below five and this is in less than 10 minutes you have the buildup of acidity and this is due to dental plaque okay enough of that let's move from here and this is a good review by the way folks to do a comparison of dental caries periodontal disease and ANUG and that's table 24-1 and I encourage you to also not only go through that, but the microassessment uh, as well as case prevention coming up. But before we go there, we're still at the upper digestive system, and we've got to get to face this little monster. Now, I say monster because it took scientists a long time to finally figure out that there was some type of, <clears throat> excuse me, microorganism that contributed to the formation of stomach ulcers. Helicobacter pylori. Uh, it's also referred to as Helicobacter pylori gastritis. The initial infection sign is belching to vomiting. Localized abdominal pain or tenderness, later bleeding complicated by ulcer, or in some cases after extended period of time, cancer. Helicobacter pylori is a spiral gram-negative microaerophilic organism with sheath flagella. Now, if you notice below there, there's a formula there. What it is capable of doing to handle the hostile, very acidic environment that it's in, in the stomach. It has an enzyme, urease, that takes urea, breaks it down to carbon dioxide, which accounts for the belching, and makes also ammonia. 
The ammonia neutralizes the acidity, so it kind of puts itself as sort of an ammonia barrier around the cell, prevents the stomach acids from destroying it. And what it'll eventually do is start to do this. And that is a process where it will reside in the stomach mucus, thin out the stomach mucus. The bacteria will initiate inflammatory and immune responses, which destroy the stomach epithelium and lead to ulcer formation. Okay. Uh, the epidemiology is usual fecal oral route. This progresses with age. Over 80% of individuals on the planet can be infected by the age of 75. Now, I'll just tell you a couple other pointers here. I talked with a doctor years ago, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Philippines, they were trying to treat and prevent this onset because they noticed that as their population got older, it was very common for them to have stomach cancer. And this was all due to infection by H. pylori. Now, the, the, the issue was, well, why don't you just give them a couple of antibiotics and an acid secretion suppression drug, and sometimes bismuth compounds, which I'll explain more how they work in a minute. But the problem, he said, was, look, they're going to go back to contaminated water. In some of the rural areas, for example, in the Philippines, the individual that's drinking the water is drinking water that's been contaminated by this helicobacter pylori because upstream somebody has used that same river water as a toilet. Yep, you got it. Ideally, everybody, it would be great if they could make a vaccine against it, but there's been no real serious uh, progress in that area. <clears throat> and by the way, how does bismuth compounds, Pepto-Bismol, uh, work? Well, bismuth salicylate products, bismuth is a heavy metal, but it doesn't usually separate from the salicylate part of the molecule. Instead, the bacteria glom onto, attached to the Pepto-Bismol, allows for eradication. And here is the general review, <coughs> excuse me, of table 24.2 of Helicobacter pylori. Now, we're going to get into the viral diseases of the upper digestive system. You want to keep in mind that the mouth has symptoms of other viral infections that usually produce more dramatic symptoms elsewhere in the body. Measles, coplic spots, mononucleosis has oral ulcers and bleeding gums, thrush, which is a yeast-based infection, a fungal infection, candida albicans infection can occur in the mouth and the throat. But the first one we're going to really deal with is oral herpes simplex, otherwise known as cold sores. Now, you take a look at 24-3, that's the table, but here are some of the symptoms. During the initial infection, you have fever, sore throat, blisters, ulcers in the mouth. Later, the disease becomes latent and reoccurs with painful, tingling, or itching sensations on the lips with subsequent blisters and ulceration. Healing takes about 7 to 10 days. Involvement with the esophagus is suggestive of an AIDS or other immunodeficiency. This is usually caused by herpes simplex type 1. Now, here's the problem. Since the 80s, uh, there's been a cultural shift. Herpes simplex used to be referred to as just oral herpes. The genital herpes version... Uh, which was normally passed as genital herpes. Well, the society started doing much more work, uh, much more activity with oral to genital contact, in other words, oral sex. And as a result, HSV1, the oral type, began being appearing in the genital region, and HSV2 began appearing in the oral region. And so now... <clears throat> Scientists don't refer to it as oral herpes and genital herpes. It's basically HSV1 and HSV2. Where is it? Well, it's here or here on the body. You see, the virus multiplies in the epithelium, produces a syncytium, which is a multinucleated cell. They get to be like giant cells. You can see that in the image there. And you'll have intranuclear inclusion bodies. What that means is that inside of the nucleus itself, the virus is going through a process of replication, and so it will do this not in the cytoplasm of the cell, but in the nucleus. Viral DNA can exist latently in a sensory nerve. That's why usually it's up in the mouth area. The virus can travel to the lymph nodes. The immune response limits the infection, unless you're immunosuppressed. Reoccurrence from the latent virus is due to stresses like sunburn, menstruation, illnesses that include a fever, or if the person is going through cancer therapy, et cetera, et cetera. 
uh, because usually that's when they're going to have some immunosuppression uh, in, in the treatments. Um, also, it's very widespread transfer can occur via sex or contact with viral lesions or virally infected saliva. HSV can infect almost any tissue, including skin regions on other parts of the body. The antiviral treatments that exist, acyclovir, pencyclovir, inhibit the HSV DNA polymerase, and this can shorten the outbreak periods. Uh, sunscreen to prevent sunburn reduces this risk of reoccurrences. Now we see this poor child here, and this is an actual case of mumps. Now what we're having here now is an infection in the salivary glands. The term mump means to whisper. The symptoms are fever, headache, loss of appetite, painful swelling in one or both parotid glands. This can also lead, particularly for older adults, to painful swelling of the testicles, pelvic pain in women. This can also lead to atrophy of the testicles or even sterility. Or a brain infection can occur leading to deafness or death from encephalitis. This is rare but possible, especially in older patients. The mumps virus is a single-stranded RNA <clears throat> excuse me, of the paromyxovirus, there's only one single viral serotype. When the virus starts by infecting the upper respiratory tract and spreads to the parotid glands and other organs via the bloodstream, swelling and pain due to inflammatory response uh, to infected cells can occur. Interestingly enough, the humans are the only source of this virus, and asymptomatic infections can lead to transmission. And um, let me bring up here something. You notice the numbers you see there, reported cases per 100,000 in the population. And you watch from 1973, and you see this really drop in a decade to like almost like two or three. Periodically, you will get spikes. Notice that, <clears throat> excuse me, the number of cases reported around the beginning of or the middle of 2006, it spiked. This was cases due to individuals who did not get vaccination boosters, because the uh, vaccine is readily available. It's an attenuated viral vaccine, uh, part of the MMR, measles, mumps, rubella vaccination. And um, reoccurring infections do not occur. So let us move on. The next one we're going to start dealing with are bacterial infections in the lower digestive system. Now, a couple of pieces of background you really need to hear. One of three children dies of diarrhea diseases in the developing world, and most of these are infants. The lower digestive system diseases have similar symptoms, diarrhea, loss of appetite, nausea, vomiting, and sometimes fever. The term gastroenteritis is the acute inflammation of the stomach and intestines, often accompanied by nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. Dysentery. This is a diarrhea illnesses, illnesses where pus and blood are present in the feces, so you have damage to the intestinal walls. Enteric fever. Usually after the initial infection, this will occur with certain strains of salmonella. The pathogens cause severe headaches, high fevers, abscesses throughout the body, intestinal rupture, shock, and death. Now, typhoid fever is an enteric fever caused by salmonella typhi bacteria. There are three kinds of bacteria that account for most infection, uh, intestinal infections. Vibro species, remember that these are salt-tolerant, curved or straight gram-negative rods. Campylobacter jejuni, this is a gram-negative comma or S-shaped bacteria Interestingly enough, it's commonly, it's found commonly with fowl, meaning birds, um, usually we're talking about ducks, geese, chickens, on the farm, that type of thing. Enterobacteria, these are closely related species that include Salmonella, Shigella, and Escherichia. Now, I turned you to review some of the information on the type 3 secretion system. This is because many bacteria use this system to inject into the host cell cytoplasm various bacteria gene products or alter the host cell to enter the cell via endocytosis. If you remember, we talked about this a while back where some bacteria could literally take um, the microvilli, flatten them out, 
and basically use that flattening platform as a means to force its way inside the cytoplasm of the cell. And you can see this, alterations in host cells, cell invasion, and of course we're talking about also toxin products. This is part of the pathogenesis that you're going to see. So main pathogenic mechanisms include attachment, toxin production, either increase the host cell secretion of water or electrolytes, or kill the host cell. The cell invasion, and then the loss of microvilli. And usually you create a pedestal or a platform to stop absorption and subsequently enter the cell. Keep in mind, when you lose loss, uh, the, the, when you lose the microvilli, you lose that extra uh, surface absorption area for nutrients. So the patient is getting sicker, not just by the fact that toxins are being uh, occurring and all that stuff, and the bacteria are multiplying, but basically because they're altering the the physiological structure of the intestinal lining cells. Now, as we've been talking, I'm sure that some of you are saying, well, can't there be some things done? This is what we bring into oral rehydration therapy. It was a therapeutic system used to maintain fluid and electrolytes during illness. Ingestion of water with sugar and some electrolytes, such as salts, will maintain the patient even while the diarrhea continues. Now, I'll give you back some pointers. <clears throat> In the World Health Organization, they had scientists and they, they, they went through studying the, the uptake and the pathogen, pathophysiology of cholera and things like that. And they found that, gee, if we give this packet made up of salts and sugar, and the sugar was to help the salt ions cross the epithelial lining and keep the person rehydrated and keep up their electrolytes, then the patient has a better chance of survival. One problem, each packet was 50 cents. 50 cents in some of the developing uh, country villages was about most what people made in a year. Yeah. So what they started to turn around and do was a program of teaching the villagers how to make a solution. And it, you took five large handfuls of sugar, five pinches of salt, mixed it in with the water, and fed it to the sick child. And what happens is they will eventually expel all of the bacteria, but they will also at the same time continue to be rehydrated and keep up their electrolyte counts and be able to survive these attacks. Even if the water was dirty, they were able to use this and help treat the patient. Now, some of you might also think about this from a related way. Gatorade. Where did Gatorade come from? The actual history of Gatorade has been told many times before, but it will just tell it to you. Florida State University, their athletes were falling on the field because it's so hot down there and they're having, they're wearing the heavy football uniforms and all the padding and they're like, what can we do? So they went to their sports medicine people and to the FSU doctors and said, can't you do something about this? And the doctors pondered it and worked out a formula that was a mixture of electrolytes and sugar and water. And they found that if they gave this to their athletes, they had strength to re, uh, resume and play through the entire game. And that's where they, Florida State got the license for it. And that's where we get the name Gatorade for the Florida Gators. And of course, the story goes on and billions and billions of bottles, et cetera, et cetera, are made. So let's start dealing with the first nasty organism, cholera. Yeah. That's that curved little wavy little nasty there, okay? Now, by the way, you got to keep in mind that there's going to be a hate label exotoxin that's involved with this process. So let's first start off. What do we have for symptoms? Very watery diarrhea. It's called rice water stool. You can pump out of you 20 liters of fluid each day. Vomiting may occur at the onset, but then you're going to have muscle cramps due to the loss of fluid and electrolytes, and you're just going to keep passing out diarrhea. And of course, they're going to have active bacteria. Then you're going to have to know how to sustain that. In some places where they don't have medical facilities, the individuals will just not even be aware of it and suddenly have an attack of diarrhea and it'll pass right out of them. And if they're near any water, they contaminate the water. And the bacteria will pass onward down 
stream to contaminate others. Now, the causative agent is Vibro cholera, gram-negative curved, alkali and salt-tolerant rod bacterium. What we have to deal with is the AB toxin. Now, this causes excessive secretion of water and electrolytes by the intestinal epithelium. What you have is the AB unit, the B unit attaches to a cell membrane receptor, causing the A to be brought inside. This A subunit of the toxin turns a G protein into an active mode and, act and fires up adenylate cyclase, which takes ATP and makes it into cyclic AMP. That's that little C there, okay? And it's just basically turning the cells into a massive pump that's pumping out um, ions and other, and other electrolytes. So basically, when we're talking ions, fluoride ion, sodium ion, potassium ion, bicarbonate ion, and of course, the water is going to follow the electrolytes out by osmosis. So in large intestine, you are going to basically be secreting a tremendous amount of fluid. Now, they call it rice water stool also because there's small bits of fecal matter and all that other stuff in there. But basically, this is not stuff that, that should be cleaned up or decontaminated uh, with any cavalier attitude. You've got to treat it very seriously because it's ample. Uh, it's going to have ample amounts of bacteria in it, and that can be spread to other persons. Ingestion of fecally contaminated food or water is how the epidemiology occurs. And this sometimes even happens with marine crustaceans. Case in point. In 1991, Peru had a very serious outbreak of cholera. And this was quite upsetting for all of the South American, Central American, and even North American nations because they were afraid that this is going to just start a cholera outbreak that will not stop. How did it all occur? It's best believed that someone had cholera on a ship that was coming into a bay uh, of a Peruvian port and had a case of cholera passed out, uh, contaminated fecal fluid into the local water. The local water, basically, you had a lot of fish and shellfish there that um, the Peruvians have a particular dish that is very delightful but uses raw fish. Yep, you're getting it. That raw fish delicacy was passed around, and that's how a lot of people started getting sick. And of course, in hot uh, conditions, people don't wash their hands as much, or they may get some contamination on them. They don't wash as effectively. The next thing you know, you've got other people contaminated. So it can be passed from not merely just contaminated water, but can be can passed by contaminated food. Okay? Now, Prevention and treatment, purification of water, careful hand washing, vaccination. There is a genetically altered vibro strain um, or killed vibro in combination with a B toxin subunit that exists. Uh, also, treatment includes rehydration therapy. And so there you see the complete rundown in table 24.5. Moving on, the next one is even more serious in some ways because it's shigellosis. And shigellosis, you have fever, dysentery, vomiting, headache, stiff neck, convulsions, and painful joints. Why? Well, the shigella, shigella species is a gram-negative, non-motile enterobacteria. But wait a minute, wait a minute. How does it get into the cells, and how does it move from one cell to another? And what are those funny little yellow lines in the upper picture there? Okay, here's the deal. What you've got is that shigella can take actin and make these polymerizing little tails that helps propel the bacteria within the host cell, sometimes with enough force that it can actually move from one cell to the next. So you have one infected M cell that picks up the Shigella bacteria. This leads to <clears throat> macrophages attempting to consume it after it's passed through the cell and got into the lower, uh, to, to some of the blood, blood vessels, etc. The macrophages will attempt to try to stop it but what these cells can do is they can hide inside. Macrophages can't attack them if they're hiding inside of intestinal uh, cells. But the intestinal cells can get punctured and are a nice culture medium 
for the Shigella bacteria as they start going through one after another. And of course, the infected cells die and sloth off. You have an intensive inflammatory response, and this will further uh, the, the downward spiral because it'll lead to bleeding and abscess formation. Now, the invasion, the multiplication, as I said, within the intestinal epithelial cells, this is uh, uh, propelled by what is referred to as the actin propulsion system. So actin, the protein, is polymerized and actually becomes a sort of tail and, and sort of this propellant that pushes the bacteria throughout the cell and through cells into the neighboring cells. You have death of cells, intense inflammation, ulceration of the intestinal lining. Now, there is a special condition that can, can occur, hemolytic uremic syndrome, HUS, which we're going to get into in a few minutes, so just hang on there. But as a result of this infection, HUS can occur. Epidemiology, the transmission is usually a fecal to oral route. Sometimes, via fecally contaminated food or water, humans are generally the only source. Now, this is an important point because overcrowding and hot humid conditions can favor some transmission. Daycare facilities, uh, summertime camps, uh, starting of school in uh, late, late August, sometimes September, they'll have small Shigella outbreaks in the school because kids have not been washing their hands. They go to the bathroom and they do whatever, and unfortunately, they don't come back clean. They start spreading it around. Prevention and treatment. Sanitation is absolutely critical. Food and water handlers must be monitored. The treatment is ampicillin and cotrimoxazole, which is trimethoprin and sulfmethazole. It shortens the symptoms and the time period for Shigella excretion. Now, this is tricky also because multiple R factors <coughs> that you're going to see in the bacteria can lead to resistance. At present, there is no vaccine available. I do encourage you, if you're a little fuzzy about the active propulsion system, to go back to pages four, uh, 644 for figure 24.2, as well as review in page 423, figure 16.7. Okay? Now, we're going to go into Escherichia coli gastrointestinalitis. Now, it's also been referred to as Montezuma's Revenge, the Turkey Trots, the Deli Belly, and other and associated with hemolytic uremic syndrome. HUS is a sequelae to infection via either Shigella or E. coli strains producing select toxins that destroy red blood cells. Now, you know, if you burst the red blood cells, where are you going to have come out of it? Hemoglobin. And a lot of this can lead to plugging up the glomeruli and that'll lead to kidney shutdown. Now, different strains of E. coli, due to the differing R factors, the toxins, can produce slightly differing symptoms. Generally, you're going to see vomiting, diarrhea, sometimes leading to dysentery. So you want to keep these things in mind. That's why they have uh, the various designations there on 24-7, okay? And we've talked about the causative agent enough, E. coli. The pathogenesis, you have various mechanisms. You're going to have attachment to intestinal cells, which will allow colonization. Some strains are going to produce exotoxins. Others invade the intestinal epithelial cells. Some may produce sugar toxin. Others cause thickening of the host cell membrane and the loss of microvilli. Now, I know some of you might be saying, well, that's almost ambiguous. It is in a way that's why they have to do uh, medical microbiological testing to determine, is it shiga? Or is it actually E. coli? And, um, you know, sometimes it's a bad sign if E. coli has picked up a couple of new tricks. All right. The epidemiology, this is very common in travelers and can be food or waterborne. Fecal oral route of transmission will occur sometimes also in animal source. Sanitation is absolutely critical for prevention. Pasteurization of food and water is also important. The proper cooking of meats. Uh, you've probably heard of many cases of E. coli from incompletely cooked ground beef. And that gets to be really sad because some of the ones that suffer the most are the kids that ate the semi-raw hamburger, not knowing that it was not a good thing to do. 
Uh, the treatment is replacement of fluid loss, antibiotics, and bismuth compounds. Again, bismuth plays a role in having the bacteria glom on and can pass out of the intestine. And with that, we're going to move into salmonella. Salmonella gastroenteritis, and you can see this on table 24-9. The symptoms include diarrhea and vomiting, prolonged fever, headache, abdominal pain, abscesses, and shock. Now, the causative agent is salmonella entrica, which is a mobile, gram-negative, enterobacteria. Invasion of the lining cells of lower, small, and large intestine, eventual penetration of the underlying tissues, leading to the subsequent inflammation, which increases fluid secretion. This is some of the nasty parts of the pathogenesis. Some survival within even macrophages and transport throughout the body, which is also really important to be aware of. Destruction of the payer patches is also possible. This can lead to enteric fever and intestinal rupture. Remember the pat payer patches are part of the malt, the mucosa-associated um, immune defenses that exist there, okay? And the epidemiology is the oral fecal route, ingestion of food contaminated by animal feces. Human fecal source in typhoid fever-like illness can occur. Prevention and treatment, proper cooking and handling of the food, attenuated vaccine against typhoid fever, no antimicrobials used unless invasion of underlying tissues or blood in stools occurs. Now, uh, you might be sitting there going, huh? Well, the typhoid fever attenuation seems to play a role also in helping against the salmonella gastroenteritis in certain cases. But they're not going to use antimicrobials unless much more of the tissues uh, and blood in the stools would be indicating that you've gotten underneath the epithelial lining of the large or small t uh, intestine. Typhoid and paratyphoid fever. Okay. Enteric fevers, we said, are a systemic disease that originates in the intestine. The symptoms... You have incubation period of one to three weeks. Yep, weeks. Then increasing fever, severe headache and constipation, and abdominal pain. Severe cases lead to intestinal rupture, internal bleeding, shock, and death. The causative agents are serotypes of Salmonella entrica. Um, they would be the serotype Salmonella serotype typhi, Salmonella serotype paratyphi. All of these are members of enterobacilli. Now, the bacteria cross the epithelium, uh, the intestinal epithelium via the M cells, and yet they resist killing by the macrophage. They multiply in them, that's all. It's sort of like, yeah, now I'm inside of you, you can't do anything to me, and I'm just going to continue to make more bacteria cells. The bacteria get, are transported systemically via the bloodstream, and that is why you're going to get now this systemic infection is going to result in fever, abscesses, sepsis. Remember, that's a systemic inflammatory response and shock. The payer patches may be destroyed, leading to intestinal rupture and hemorrhage. Epidemiology, this can spread person to person, fecal to oral, and contaminated food or water. Now, for treatment and prevention, most U.S. strains, they use fluoroquinolins to treat it. Some strains are multi-drug resistant, and that's going to be an important point. An attenuated live oral vaccine is available for typhoid, but not for the paratyphoid fever. Also, you want to keep in mind, salmonella typhi, typhoid fever, asymptomatic carriers can have S. typhi in their gallbladder. It turns out that this particular strain can withstand the harsher pH that exists inside of the gallbladder. So they can continue to keep shedding off this in their feces for years. And that's where you get into situations like typhoid Mary. Mary had it, and she was just a, basically an asymptomatic carrier. And she would not be mindful of the public health. She only had one skill that she really knew well, and that was cooking. And every place that Mary cooked, people died or they got very sick. You can see more of that on a video that I believe I put in the YouTube collection, okay? I encourage you to keep that in mind and, maybe, and take time to, to view it. Campylobacterosis. Oh, yes, here they are. 
Uh, Campylobacterosis, you have a situation where these are curved gram-negative microaerophilic rods. The symptoms of this disorder are diarrhea, fever, abdominal cramps, nausea, vomiting, and bloody stools. The interesting thing is with this particular organism, you have a low infecting dose. What I mean by that is you only need a few cells. Once the bacteria multiply within and beneath the interstitial epithelial cells, and that's why you've got to make absolutely sure that there is none of this particular organism in contaminated food, et cetera, because it's going to be a nightmare. It will initiate inflammatory response. It will transport to blood. Transport to blood is uncommon, though. Guillaume-Barre syndrome can occur, although it's rare, and lead to a progressive paralysis. It's suspected to be autoimmune initiated from a reaction to viral or bacterial infection. The incidence about 0.1%. The epidemiology, largely food, foodborne and waterborne outbreaks. That's why, folks, I did a while back food microbiology. It originates from chickens and cattle. Person-to-person -person transmission is rare. The prevention and treatment, water chlorination and pasteurization is very effective. Avoiding cross-contamination of uncooked and cooked foods. Remember I talked about the plate. Don't put your uncooked chicken from the plate to the grill and then take the grilled chicken and put it back on that same plate with the raw juices. You're going to be getting a real bad uh, illness if you do it that way. Usually, this type of infection is not severe and recovery can occur without antibiotics. But if it, if it is severe, erythromycin is required. The next one, and this is the table 2411 here, for campylobacteriosis, and I just encourage you to review it. That, folks, is the result of Clostridium difficile infection. This is an urgent health concern by the Centers for Disease Control. This is recognized as the cause of antibiotic-associated diarrhea, dysbiosis of intestinal microbiota. That's what I'm saying here is the pseudomembranes that you see are all result of CDI. What you have is incubation of incubation of less than a week. It starts off first as mild diarrhea, progressing to colitis in the formation of pseudomembranes, which is what you see right there. And now you have pseudomembranous colitis. This causative agent is Clostridium difficile. It is a gram-positive, rod-shaped, endospore-forming obligate anaerobe. Hypervirulent strains have been found to be resistant to fluoroquinolones. And the pathogenesis is, is that it produces toxins. And the toxins include an AV type, which disrupts the intestinal host cell. You will have actin polymerization and cell signaling resulting in death of the intestinal epithelium. Toxins also cause macrophages to release pro-inflammatory cytokines. In other words, think about it this way. What the toxins will do is fire off the macrophages to pump lots of cytokines, which will then cause a massive inflammatory response. And all these factors will lead to the formation of the pseudomembranes. Where do you see this occurring? It occurs in hospitalized patients on antibiotic therapy. Infectious endospores are shed in feces and can be transmitted into the environment or via hospital workers or other patients. Um, the treatment and prevention. A lot of times you have to cease antibiotic therapy, and that can lead to cleanup of the symptoms. Also, you need to treat with vancomycin and metrodiazinol. Fixomycin is a new FDA-approved drug to deal with this. There is also the potential that since the original intestinal microbiota was wiped out by, let's say, broad-spectrum antibiotic treatment, that led to the conditions for CDI to flourish. A fecal transplant, yep, a fecal microbiota transplant, using healthy fecal bacteria to reestablish the normal intestinal microbiota, microbiota will be required, okay? And basically people would take big capsules, and that's what, would, what I understand how the procedure is. And you can see on table 2412 this, and now we're going to move into viral diseases of the lower digestive system. First, rotavirus. 
Now, you have to keep in mind that if we have viral diseases, we're going to be talking about both the liver and the intestine can be infected. The first one, rotaviral uh, gastroenteritis. The symptoms, cause of most of the cases of viral gastroenteritis in infants and children are rotaviruses. You have vomiting, slight fever, profuse watery diarrhea, generally recover in a week. Death from dehydration can occur unless rehydration treatment is given. Now, the causative agent rotavirus, which is a member of the Rio virus family, is double-walled, capsid, double-stranded, 11-segment RNA genome. Okay, So the segmented RNA genome has actually more pieces in it than an influenza virus. Remember, the influenza was only eight pieces. But the virus infects mainly the epithelial cells of the upper small intestine. It leads to cell death and decreased production of digestive enzymes. The recovery takes up to a few weeks. How do we get it? Fecal oral route again. By age four, ch children usually have acquired some immunity to the disease, can also account for up to 25% of the traveler's diarrhea cases. Rotavirus on a cruise ship is a nightmare, and that has happened in certain cases. And literally, the staff. Uh, there is actually, if you go to the CDC website, you will find that there is actually a document there, uh, uh, kind of like a, uh, a brochure, and then also more detailed plans on how to deal with outbreaks of these type of diseases on cruise ships and travel ships and things like that. And what has to really go on is an extensive decontamination of every possible uh, fomite, you know, handle, handrail, you know, on floors, everything else that can be possible where somebody was around. Prevention and treatment, hand washing, disinfectant, sanitation. The virus had a vaccine, but it was recalled due to adverse effects, particularly one of them was intestinal blockage. Okay. Now, the other one that we're dealing with is the norovirus. And the symptoms there for their gastroenteritis are, again, vomiting, abdominal cramps, diarrhea, Usually, though, this is a short-term disease, about 24 to 48 hours. The, Noro, the Norwalk virus is a Kelsey virus family member. It's naked, single-stranded, positive-sense RNA virus. Okay. Infects the upper small intestine epithelium, and the effects are very similar to the rotavirus, and recovery is usually within two weeks. Transmission fecal-oral route. Typically, you'll have an infection to children and adults, sometimes can be transmitted via shellfish. At present, there's no real vaccine. Prevention is similar, hand washing, disinfectants, that type of thing. And as you can see, there is a comparison here on table 2413. I just want to give you some idea to review that between rotavirus and norovirus. Now we're going to go through viral diseases of the lower digestive uh, system, and this will include, of course, the liver. And what I see, what I want you to see here is a listing: virus A, virus you know, Hep B, Hep A, Hep C. Okay, how the numbers get affected once a vaccine is licensed. 1982, you saw this somewhat upward slope. And then as time went on, hepatitis B incident decreased greatly. In about a decade, you saw a serious decrease. Hepatitis A vaccine got licensed in 1995. And no longer do you see this up and down, up and down. You see this continually going downward. Hepatitis C, they have been making some progress on that. Although the numbers are smaller, hepatitis C used to be put into this big grab bag. Okay, now, you're not going to lose a lot of sleep, and I don't want you to, uh, between what's hep A, hep B, hep C, etc., because hep C, interestingly enough, was kind of originally called non-A, non-B. And since then, they have found that there is, yes, are you ready? A hep E, F, G, and H. Now, these are different viruses. And as time goes on and we understand how the symptoms and the pathogenesis and the cause of agent are, we can be, be able to separate out certain things and use vaccines or other types of treatment where necessary. Excuse me. 
So let's talk about hep A, B, C, all right? D really doesn't exist in the sense that it shows up, but it's usually associated as empty viral shells for hep D. They call them the delta particles. <clears throat> All right. Hep E does exist. Now, hep A. Formerly was called infectious hepatitis. Symptoms were uh, fatigue, fever, loss of appetite, nausea. Abdominal pain on the right side. Well, that only makes sense. That's where the liver is. Dark colored urine. Clay colored feces. Now, clay colored feces is indicative of the fact that you're not having certain products, particularly uh, bile produced. And so, where's the bile going to go? It's going to go forming jaundice. So, you got a staining of this yellow pigments in the whites of the eyes and in the skin. <laughs> Excuse me. Children less than six years old. Um, will appear 70% are, will be asymptomatic, okay? Um, the causative agent is hepatitis A virus. It's a small, single-stranded RNA virus of the Picorno virus family. Pathogenesis is that viral transport to the liver is uncertain. The liver is the main site of viral replication. The liver is damaged by the infection, and the virus will be shed in bile and in feces. Epidemiology, fecal oral route. Food handlers can contaminate food. Daycare, nursing home, and homosexual men can be populations that transmit the virus. Prevention and treatment, recovery of adults within two months. During recovery, patients must not consume alcohol or other hepatotoxins uh, because you're trying to get recovery of the function of the liver. It should not be stressed at that time. Gamma globulin containing HAV antibody can be given for passive immunization within two weeks or so of exposure. Hep B, formerly known as serum hepatitis, the symptoms are similar to A. The symptoms are much more severe, and death from liver failure occurs in 1 to 10 percent of hospitalized cases. Now, the causative agent for hepatitis B, the virus is a heptadenovirus, meaning it's HEPA liver. DNA is its viral genome. So it's an enveloped DNA uh, double-stranded with a partial single strand. Antigens of importance, there is a surface antigen, a core antigen, an E antigen, which is a surface antigen, and, and, and the surface antigen floods the bloodstream and can occur in empty viron structures. Now, the pathogenesis is that it's carried to the liver via the bloodstream. Infecting liver cells requires basically a reverse transcriptase to make viral copies of DNA, and that's made from the HBV RNA. Transmission by carriers can occur, transmission via blood, blood products, semen, such as in sexual intercourse, cuts, sharing of IV needles, unsterile or shared tattoo needles, razors, etc. HBV vaccine exists. The victims must avoid um, alcohol and other hepatic toxins. No curative antiviral treatment exists. Slowdown of the symptoms exists with interferon and lambutidine, which is a reverse transcriptase inhibitor. Okay, hepatitis C. Symptoms similar to HAV and HBV, but they're milder. Causative agent, hepatitis C virus, which is an RNA flavivirus. Pathogenesis, there's not as many details, but the infection is due to contaminated blood. Usually few symptoms, there is a progressive liver damage. Liver cancer in 10 to 20% of the cases can occur. Chronic carriers exist. Blood exchange, illegal drug use, unsterile tattoo needles, shaving razors, etc. can be a, a means of exchange and, you know, passing on the disease. There is unfortunately no vaccine right now. There is interferon treatment and ribavirin, which is an antiviral nucleotide drug, to slow the disease progress, but there's been a new reported cure using Zapatier, which is a combination of elbasavir and grazaprevir. Both are protease uh, inhibitors, and they block the viral replication, thereby stop the passage. Here is an example of jaundice in the sclera of the eye and in the skin. This is due to the backup of bile pigments uh, from the liver back into the blood. 
And as you can see here, on 2018, just by the onset of the vaccine being made available, you see in all the different parts of the country, you see within only a few years, this massive decline in the number of cases per 100,000 copies, uh, 100,000 population, okay, patients. Here you see the complete infectious virion, and I believe this is H, hepatitis B. And then you have the spherical as well as the elongated ones. And if they're empty, they're referred to as delta particles. But how the vaccine was made was fascinating. I'll just bring this up real quick. The, the viral vaccine, everybody was in the 80s getting scared of having anything in the sense of a product that was made from blood. Hepatitis B, they took the gene for an outer surface antigen, put it into bacteria, and the bacteria made loads and loads and loads and loads, or it was yeast, one or the other. And basically, they extracted out, and they had the perfect hepatitis B uh, protein vaccine. You get, I believe it's like three shots. One on day one, one on day 30, and one on day 90, which is basically 60 days after uh, the uh, second shot. And you should be good for at least five years. But usually, rather than giving you a booster, a lot of the doctors will say, look, I'm going to pull a tighter. And if you show up with antibodies against B, you're good. You won't need it. And that's what they found over the years. Okay. And you can see how hepatitis B enters into the cell, gets into the nucleus, hijacks the, the molecular and DNA processes, and then begins the process of assembling new core viruses and eventually leaving. Now, let's move into protozoal parasites of the lower digestive system. Yep. Protozoans. Now, you got to keep in mind the names associated with the structure of the protozoans. A mastigophora is usually associated with a flagella. A ciliophora is associated with cilia. A complexia, these are usually immobile. They're not going to be able to move around. Sarcodinian, those that move around by pseudopodia. A cosidinian is a member of the A complexia that infects intestinal or blood cells. In essence, it is an intercellular parasite. A trophozoite is the vegetative active stage of the protozoan. Then a cyst, this is a dormant resting protozoal cell characterized by a thickened cell wall. So in other words, this is something that would be basically be shed out in, in the waste, in the feces, and then could pass to some other person via fecal to oral route. The cyst is an inactive form of the protozoan, usually the means in which it would be transported. Why? Because the trophozoite, the active vegetative form, is usually fragile and will die outside of the host. So the first one we're going to deal with is giardiasis. Okay, now, what do you have? You have mild symptoms, indigestion, flatulence, nausea, severe di uh, vomiting, diarrhea, and eventually, you, you know, you notice that the, the uh, symptoms are getting worse. Abdominal cramps and weight loss. Now, you got to think about this. What Giardia limbilia, a flagellated mastigophora with a pear-shaped uh, body, pear-shaped cell, having two nuclei. They almost appear like eyes. But what they have is two attachment discs, and they will attach to the intestinal epithelium. Now, you're not going to just have one of these. You're going to have not just five or ten of these. You're going to have thousands of these, if not millions. And as you basically have these cells cover the absorptive surface area of the intestine, the flatulence, the indigestion, the nausea, this, and the diarrhea and all these other things, what's happening is you're not going to be absorbing your nutrients. The flatulence and gas is going to be caused by other organisms in the intestinal lumen feasting on what should have been the other material that you should be absorbing, okay? The weight loss is because you're not absorbing your nutrients as you have your meal. And also, yes, the uh, Giardia are feasting on some of this too. Now, they're going to inhabit the upper part of the small intestine. The protozoa will travel towards the large intestine. And if it gets into there, it may convert into a cyst. The cysts have the thick walls containing chitin. And two protozoans reside in each cyst. Okay. You have to keep be mindful of another couple of things. The cells lack mitochondria. Now, why is that somewhat important? 
some of them have other mechanisms to basically process glucose and get energy. Now, the pathogenesis is that either attached to the in in internal epithelium or the intestinal epithelium, or they move through the intestinal mucus. Some even travel into the bile duct and gallbladder, and this can cause a crampy pain or jaundice. Severe outbreaks will cover the intestinal lining and block intestinal absorption and intestinal secretion of enzymes. This will result in malnutrition, bulky feces, this is known as fat, fatty laden feces or sterorrhea, as well as flatulence, okay? Now here's the situation, it's a fecal oral route, and it, sadly, only 10 cysts are required for infection. Where are the sources? Beavers, raccoons, dogs, cats, muskrats, and humans. The interesting thing is you will see in some cases, and here's some more of them, against the intestinal walls. And here's another view of them. This is from uh, the image 2422. One of the things you got to keep in mind is this. Individuals will sometimes um, basically defecate, and they won't defecate in the proper place. So they'll defecate near water, and so the water is contaminated. Uh, this was formerly, by campers, they would refer to as beaver fever because beavers were, were commonly having this. So if you're camping and you look upstream and you see a beaver, um, a beaver lodging or a beaver dam, that's not the water you want to drink. Or you better really, really treat and boil and disinfect that water before you do drink it. Um, as you can see in that lower image there, that's an actual picture of what would be eventually thousands and thousands, if not millions, of Giardia attached to the intestinal site. And that would also mean that you're losing the capability of absorbing the nutrients as they pass through the intestine. Prevention, boil and disinfect water. Treatment. Uh, quinacrine hydrochloride, otherwise known as atrabrine, and metrodiazinol, which is also known as flagyl, or flagyl. And here is the final details here. The intestinal gas is usually because of a combination that the bacteria in the intestine are going to be using the nutrients that are not being absorbed. Uh, some of the GRDL ambilia may have a hydrogosome, which is part of the means and they will produce a little bit of hydrogen, which will contribute to the intestinal gas. Now, the next one we're going to deal with is cryptosporidiosis. This is uh, another protozoan. You will have symptoms of fever, loss of appetite, nausea, crampy abdominal pain, watery diarrhea, and can last 10 to 14 days. The causative agent is cryptosporidium parvum. The life cycle takes place entirely within the small intestine epithelial cells. The cysts, called osis, contain four banana-shaped sporozoites. Following ingestion of an osis, intestinal juices will cause the release of the sporozoites. The sporozoites invade the epithelial cells, deform the cells in villi, then incite an inflammatory response. Secretion of water and electrolytes increases while absorption of nutrients decreased. The process is brought under control via cell-mediated immunity. Now, normally the method of infection is fecal oral route. Oocysts are resistant to chlorine. They can pass through municipal water filtration systems. That's why uh, there was an outbreak, and I believe it was, I think it was Cleveland or Minnesota, or Minneapolis, that they had an outbreak in the 90s, and it was in part because they, they're they minimizing the amount of chlorine, and it didn't do the job, and they had to go into a new form, which I think was ozonation and UV to disinfect the water. But the host range includes not only humans, but cattle, pigs, and dogs. Pasteurization of drinking water and beverages is part of the prevention. Filtering water using a one micron or smaller filters is necessary, as well as sanitation of animal feces. Unfortunately, there's no really effective treatment. Cyclosporidiitis, that's another one. It's another member of acomplexia. Uh, you have fatigue, loss of appetite, vomiting, watery diarrhea, and weight loss. Symptoms improve in three to four days, but relax relapses can occur up to a month later. Now, Cyclosporia catenatus is a Cassidian member of Acomplexia, and it is a, a quite infecting. 
Although little is known, the asexual and sexual stages are found in the intestinal epithelial biopsies. It is interesting to note that the oral to fecal route is suspected, but oocysts do not appear infectious. The travelers to tropical countries are at risk of infection. Uh, use of boiled or filtered water in the tropics, washing thoroughly all berries and vegetables, especially if they've been imported. There is a treatment called uh, cotrioxazole, and what you have to understand is this, that this came up as a surprise in the later 90s, when you had this very large wedding party, about 200 people, and they all got sick. And what they were able to finally track it down to was this big fruit ball inside of a watermelon that everybody had. And then they were first thinking it was the strawberries, and then it turned out to be the raspberries, and they were tra tracing back the raspberries, and it was in Guatemala that these raspberries were brought up. And cyclosporidiosis is a native there. And they found that it was native more, at least at that time, to India, Nepal, and those type of areas. They think this was passed on by somebody who was doing a world travel, stopped, worked in Guatemala for a while. And, of course, their fields do not have porta potties Defecated in the field, didn't wash their hands, and the products got contaminated. The next one is... Amoebiasis, the symptoms of diarrhea, abdominal pain, blood and feces. Now, if you know blood and feces, you're talking about bleeding in the intestinal lining. Keep that in mind. The biggie is Entamoeba histolytica. It's a sarcodinian, sarcodinian protozoan. The ingested cysts are, liberate trophocytes in the small intestine. The trophocytes will feed on mucus and intestinal epithelial cells and irritate the lining to cause an intestinal cramps and diarrhea. That's not all what they'll do. Many of these strains produce cytotoxic enzymes that breach the intestinal lining. They will create an ulceration on the intestinal wall. Yep, and you'll see live uh, uh, the amoeba in that ulceration. This will cause the bloody diarrhea. Trophocytes may be transported via the bloodstream to the liver and other organs to create abscesses. The epidemiology is oral and fecal route. Mature cysts pass in the feces to contaminate soil, water, hands, and food. Disease associated, this is a big disease associated with poverty, homosexual men, and migrant workers. The prevention, good sanitation and hygiene. Treatment, metrodiazinol and paramomycin. And there's a cyst that you can see right there. Before I leave, I want to just bring up that I encourage you to take the time to do the microassessment, the diseases in review, the future opportunities, and the chapter review. We will now move into the general urinary infections, chapter 27. And as I said before, I encourage you to take time to review the key terms and the glimpse of history. So let's talk about the general urinary system. First off, the urinary system. As you can see here, 27.1. Basically, the function is to filter blood of many waste materials while selectively reabsorbing those substances that can be reused, such as sodium and potassium to a degree, and glucose. This system consists of kidneys, ureters, bladder, and the urethra. Consistently, an alkaline urine suggests an infection with bacteria that are using urease to produce ammonia as a protective measure against the acidity of the urine. Infections of the urethra occur more frequently in women as the female urethra is short and is adjacent to genital and intestinal tracts, the, vag the vagina and the anus. Normal urine acts to flush microorganisms out of the system before an infection can start. Now, um, we deal with the genital system. For the female, this consists of the vagina, cervix, uterus, fallopian tubes, ovaries, vulva, um, which is the female external genitalia consisting of the labia, clitoris, and vagina. And uh, this is a means, as a portal of entry for various pathogens. The male genital system consists of the urethra, vas deferens, epididymis, testes. Sperm can act as transport vehicles for various pathogens into upper regions of the female reproductive tract. Semen, including the seminal fluids, can also contain various fungal, bacterial, and viral pathogens, 
but bacteria can attach to sperm cells as they migrate through the female re reproductive tract. Okay. Now, the normal microbiota. Urine and the urinary tract above the bladder is normally free of microorganisms. The lower urethra has normal microbiota consisting of lactobacillus, staphylococcus, but they are coagulase negative, corny bacterium, haemophilus, uh, streptococcus, and bacterioides. The normal microbiota of the gen genital tract is influenced by the estrogen levels during the female reproductive cycle. Now, this is why. See, the lactobacilli are active in the presence of glycogen, which can be released from cervical and vaginal epithelium under control of estrogen. The lactobacilli will convert glycogen to, into lactic acid and thereby reduce the pH of the lumen and inhibit growth of many other pathogens. Also, lactobacilli will produce hydrogen per peroxide to inhibit growth of other organisms. Now, keep this in mind, particularly with, <clears throat> excuse me, the vaginal area, if the, if the patient is under broad spectrum antibiotics, this can disrupt the normal microbiota and lead to other infections. And one of them right off the bat is uh, yeast infections. And women will talk about that very freely. They got a yeast infection and now they've got to be treated with anti-yeast uh, drugs. And this was because the normal microbiota was disrupted when they were given the broad spectrum antibiotic. Okay, moving on. Now, causes for urinary infection include improper emptying of the bladder, trauma of the urethra from catheterization, transport of pathogens from blood, through kidneys, and finally appearing in the urine. For example, salmonella typhi. First area we're gonna to touch upon is bacterial cystitis which I would refer you to table 27.1. Cystitis is the inflammation and infection involving the urinary bladder. Pyelonephritis, the bacterial infection in the kidneys. If chronic, can scar the kidneys, shrink the size of the kidneys, and even lead to eventual kidney shutdown. The symptoms of this, an abrupt onset, burning pain during urination, urgency and frequent need to urinate, foul smell, uh, smelling red colored urine with pyelonephritis, fever, chills, back pain, and vomiting. The causative agent is Escherichia coli. There are other enterobacteria that may play a role. Staphylococcus saprophyticus, also some nosocomial infections of Pseudomonas, Serechia, and Enterococcus can, can contribute. The bacteria are usually ascending the urethra, enter the bladder, Attach bacterial pili to bladder epithelial cells. Cell slothing and inflammation can occur. Infection can spread to the kidneys via the ure uh, urethras, excuse me, ureters, sorry about that, leading to pyelonephritis and possible kidney failure. The epidemiology, this is common in young women and common in nosocomial infections. Risk factors include short urethra, use of a diaphragm, Sexual intercourse, this is also referred to by some as honeymoon cystitis, as well as catheters, especially for paraplegics. Infections can occur with men with enlarged prostates. This can occur in men after 50 years old. And therefore, as an, the enlarged prostate compresses the urethra, it makes it difficult to completely void uh, the urinary bladder. Prevention and treatment. Well, you have sufficient fluid intake to allow for the proper voiding of the bladder. Women properly wiping, that is cleaning from front to back, not back to front. Use of short-term antibiotics unless there's a pyelonephritis occurring and then the antibiotics require longer-term usage. Okay. Now the next one we have is leprospiridiosis and these are the leprospira interrogans. Okay. Many of these cases are mild or asymptomatic. Others have a biphasic illness and with a spiking fever, headache, muscle pain, bloodshot. That's the septicemic phase. And then one to three days of improvement. And the second phase comes in. And this is the immune phase. You have severe symptoms with heart, brain, liver, and kidney damage. Now, as I said, leptospira interrogans. This is a spirochete. There are many serotypes. 
their aerobic gram-negative spirochete with hooked ends. You can see the hook there. And the pathogenesis, you know, from infected urine or water, bacteria penetrate the mucous membranes or into the skin. They spread via the bloodstream to various organs. This may lead to unnecessary surgery for suspected appendicitis or gallbladder infection. Most organisms are removed by the immune system, except in the kidneys where it multiplies. The reoccurrence of organisms later causes clotting of blood, and this is due to damage to the capillary epithelium and causes damage to many of the organs, including the kidneys. Now, there's a disorder called Wheels disease. This is where you have the leptospiridiosis spirochetes damage the liver and kidney. They lead to jaundice and hemorrhage to many of the organs, meningitis, and may be fatal. Epidemiology, these infect many wild and domestic animals, and therefore organisms can be excreted in the urine, and urine spots are infectious up to two weeks. So this is part of it. Some infected rodents excrete the bacteria for their entire lifetime. So one of the problems is that you'll have cases of this where individuals are cleaning up urine. Probably they're trying to clean up abandoned buildings or old places where little critters had moved into. Uh, and unfortunately, they're, they're dealing with infected material that they cannot or should not breathe in or come in contact where they could pick it up. You know, goggles would help, uh, gloves would help, etc. There is a multivalent vaccine that's available for domestic animals, but does not prevent carriers. Prevention includes avoiding infected urine. Tetracyclines um, are an antibody, antibiotic preventative during epidemics. Early antibiotic treatment is useful. Symptoms can get worse due to leprospiridia antigen release. Now, here's where we get into a new term. You need to know this. The yarish herxheimer reaction. It is transitory. And what it is doing is you will see worsening of symptoms. And this is due to the massive release of leptospiridia antigens as the cells are lysed during antibiotic therapy. So yarish herxheimer reaction. They're getting worse, Doc. They will eventually get better. But the patient does have to be monitored during this part of the cycle. Next. Now we call it Non-venereal genital system diseases. Let's go and clarify a few things here. Yes, you, probably many of you do not recall the term VD or venereal diseases. They called them later STDs or STIs. Let's go into that. There was a time that STDs, for the most part, were just referred for gonorrhea and syphilis. And that was like the 60s and the 70s. And then we started having other, other ones show up, like herpes and a few other ones, and then AIDS got everybody at uh, their attention and everything else in the 80s. When we talk about venereal, it, it comes from the term Venus, the goddess of love. So venereal disease is usually a result of something sexual. But a non-venereal, it's not transmitted by a sexual act, but due to modern activities, this term changed to sexually transmitted diseases, and even if the disease is also transmitted by other means. Keep in mind, the, the term sexual transmission includes other means than vaginal intercourse. And yet, in these processes, pathogens can still be transmitted. Now, also rarely discussed is uh, pure puritable fever, childbed, uh, childbed fever. This was a transmission of streptococcus bacteria due to doctors not washing their hands prior to contact with a newborn during the childbirth process. And I refer you to the pages back there for a Semmelweis's work in isolating this. Colostridium perfringens, gas gangrene, can be transferred to form uterine gas gangrene during unsterile, unsafe, back alley abortions and self-induced abortions. So let's get into some of these first. A bacterial vaginosis. A vaginosis is a vaginal infection Vaginitis is a vaginal infection with inflammation, okay? Symptoms, grayish-white vaginal discharge and unpleasant fishy odor. Cause, Gardenalia vaginalis and other anaerobic strains that exist. Mobile leucius, provotella, and mycoplasma. The lactobacilli count drops 
indicating the loss of lactic acid in the normal microbiota. Pathogenesis. Now, this is kind of uncertain, but the normal microbiota bi uh, population changes. And you have increased sloughing off of vaginal epithelium in absence of inflammation. There is an odor due to the anaerobic organism's metabolites. One sign, you have what is called a clue cell. That's a vaginal epithelial cell covered with adherent anaerobic bacterial cells. And you can see this on this image here. Okay. This can cause problems during pregnancy and cause premature births. And you can see these here also, the clue cell, the bacteria. <clears throat> Epidemiology, it's usually associated with many sexual partners, not always associated with sexual intercourse. There's no clear preventive measures except abstinence. The treatment is metrodiazinol or clindamycin. Vulval vaginal candidiitis. This, you have itching, burning, thick white vaginal discharge, redness, and swelling of the vaginal walls. And the causative agent is candidia albicans, as you can see here. In this image, you have a stained smear of the vaginal discharge of a woman, and you see the, the uh, candidia Albicans, you see the pseudo hyphae, and then you see the rest of the cells, which are more or less budding uh, yeast cells or yeast cell like. So, remember the difference between if it's more um, hyphae, you'd have long, long strings and lines, etc. In this case, it's more in the yeast format where it's single round kind of cells. And you do see actually an image up at the top where you have a budding of that cell. Okay, so you're going through division there. <clears throat> now, the yeast organism. It's normally part of the normal microbiota, but it's growing out without any restraint. Usually, it's kept in check by the lactobacilli bacteria, and this can be upset by antibiotics. You will also have sometimes this occurring with individuals with uncontrolled diabetic sugar conditions in the urine. You will also see this occur with some individuals on certain oral contraceptives. Uh, the epidemiology, usually this is not contagious and usually not sexually transmitted. There are no proven preventative measures. Intravaginal antifungal medications such as nystatin, clotrimazole, and oral fluconazole, diflucan, are seems to be the ones that can handle this problem. Okay. Now the next area we're going to get into is kind of a different situation. Uh, this happened particularly in the 80s. Actually, my sister-in-law almost passed away from it. Thank God that they caught it in time. Um, it is called staphylococcal toxic shock, otherwise known as toxic shock syndrome. This is more or less caused by a, a standard of behavior rather than the, a new disease. The standard of behavior was using superabsorbent tampons. But what happens? They have symptoms of fever, vomiting, diarrhea, muscle aches, blood, low blood pressure, and a rash that peels. They are having a, a buildup of staphylococcus aureus, and you have selective toxins that are produce, producing, selective toxin-producing strains. And what happens is toxin TSST1 and others are produced by these certain strains. These are super antigens causing a massive cytokine release and a drop in blood pressure. This is, was a, uh, associated with superabsorbency tampons. And for individuals that were leaving the tampons in place for long periods of time, also, the abrasion of the vagina during the tampon use. So what happens is the S. aureus strains get introduced into other parts of the body as a result, and then they become systemic. The prevention and treatment, awareness of the symptoms, prompt treatment of S. aureus infections, frequent change of tampons for menstruating women, and antibiotic treatment of S. aureus strains and intravenous fluids. Basically, what happened was... Um, the intense publicity, the suspect tampon was taken off the market, as you can see that spike there during the beginning of 1980s. And basically then you had the absorbency was lowered and then you had the FDA requiring tampon labeling within two years. And then the cases that uh, were occurring were dropping off by the mid eighties. And finally the FDA standards standardizes absorbency labeling 
And it's a very rare event, but may I just suggest to all of you that are healthcare providers, never let your guard down. Never. Because something may come out and people's memory sometimes is very short or is in denial, especially when it comes to a corporate profit. We've got a better way to do it. We can be sure that this won't happen again. And it wasn't necessarily the making of the tampon. It was people leaving it in far too long, thinking that, well, it's super absorbed. And then we end up with problems. Okay. So just to be aware of this. Now we're going to start getting into. Uh, we're going to start getting into sexually transmitted infections. Now, <clears throat> this was actually in an earlier version of uh, Nestor's book, but I thought it was very important. And if you look at this, you have these individuals having sex with these individuals. And as the time period goes on, in each of these encounters, you start having individuals that will have uh, asymptomatic infections, but not just of one organism, but multiple organisms, not just bacterial, but viral. And it goes on and on and on. Many symptoms can indicate an STD. Many STIs, that's another way of saying sexually transmitted infections. We don't just say sexually transmitted disease anymore, which the names change, but the seriousness never does. Can spread via sexual contact, including vaginal, oral, or anal intercourse, usually by exchange of body fluids, including blood, semen, vaginal secretions, or saliva. As I said, this was formerly called sexually transmitted disease, and an older term was called venereal disease. Now, you need to be aware of a couple of other points. There are other diseases that can be transmitted sexually, shigellosis, giardiitis, scabies, viral hepatitis, and E. coli. So let's start off with, as you can see, here are some of the signs and symptoms that suggest an STI. We're going to start off with gonorrhea. Now, in gonorrhea, the men, there may be no uh, symptoms. They um, may have pain in urination or a ure urethral discharge with complications of impaired urinary flow, sterility, or arthritis. For women, there may be no symptoms or pain on urination, discharge, fever, pelvic pain, sterility, atopic pregnancy, arthritis may, may occur later. Women are more likely than men to be asymptomatic carriers. And what is the causative agent? Nesseria gonorrhea. Now, by the way, that earlier scene, you saw a urethral discharge that looked somewhat pussy. And that may be another indication. Uh, it may also just be mere semen, but the, but the reality is that most individuals don't always associate what's going on. Now, this is a gram-negative diplococcus. The organisms attach uh, to select non-ciliated epithelial cells, either in the urethra, ure, uh, urine, uh, uterine cervix, pharynx, or conjunctiva by the pili. Yes, that means it can get into the eyes. Um, phase and antigenic variation allow the bacteria to evade immune host defenses. In other words, they keep changing their outer coats, etc. In men, scar tissue forms in the urethra and impedes flow of urine. Infection may spread to prostate gland and testes. In women, bacteria thrive in the vaginal wall, cervix, and fallopian tubes. They can scar the fallopian tubes and lead to sterility or atopic pregnancies. There is a term called PID, pelvic inflammatory disease. This is where you have untreated infections that migrate through the uterus and the fallopian tubes, leading to inflammation in the pelvic region. It can affect the fallopian tubes, uterus, ovaries, and related structures, and can spread to the liver and other abdominal organs. It can also be caused by chlamydia trachomatis, which we'll get into. That's a virus. Prevention. By the way, this is the uh, end gonorrhea with the pili. The prevention. Uh, well, well, let me first go through this again. Um, the epidemiology, it's transmitted by sexual contact. Asymptomatic carriers can exist, and there is no immunity to this disease. Okay. 
Prevention and treatment, multi-drug resistant strains have been reported. I need to bring this up to your attention now that there are now not just merely MDXs, but there are X, or I should say, uh, extreme drug resistant XDR versions of gonorrhea that is getting quite a lot of attention in certain medical circles because it's been coming off the Korean Peninsula for some time and is now spreading throughout certain areas of Asia, and there are also some of the med medical doctors from military bases are reporting it. And these things are resistant to a bunch of different types of drugs. How do you prevent it? Well, multiple drug resistance have been reported. As I said, abstinence is one way, some use of condoms, but there are problems with that. Not all condoms, you have to understand, are just a solid barrier. They may have micro holes in them that allow certain pathogens to pass through. Uh, lambskin is one that is a serious problem. Early treatment of sex contacts is uh, a major means of prevention, or I should say at least control. Also, what do you really treat with? You have to have intramuscular cefotrexone and fluoroquinolones for the treatment. So, now we're going to start talking about chlamydial genital system. And I have to stand corrected because chlamydia trachomonas I mentioned was a virus and I stand corrected it's not. This is a uh, bacteria that lives inside the cells. That's what it is. And um, it's an obligate intercellular bacterium. There are certain serotypes. In men, you will see a thin, white, a gray-white penile discharge and painful testes. In women, a vaginal discharge, vaginal bleeding, lower and upper abdominal pain. And you can see the life cycle here, where you basically get inside of the cell, you form a reticulate body, you start going to going binary fission, uh, reticulate bodies and inclusion. Eventually, the multiplication ceases as it takes over most of the cytoplasmic volume. And eventually, you have the release of the elementary bodies as the cell bursts. And you can see the chlamydia is here against the microvilli of the cells. And then what? Well, the elementary body, as I showed you, is an infectious cell which attaches to specific receptors on the epithelial cell, which then reproduces inside the cell as a reticulate body and spreads to other host cells. Infected cells release cytokines, and this is going to cause an inflammatory reaction. The infection spreads from the urethra. In men, the infection spreads to tubules that collect sperm, carrying pain, uh, causing pain and swelling. In women, the infection spreads to the cervix, uterus, fallopian tubes, which will cause scarring and sterility or infertility. It can also lead to PID, pelvic inflammatory disease. Epidemiologically, there's a large number of asymptomatic carriers there. Non-sexual transmission has been due to non-chlorinated swimming pools. Non-chlorinated. Prevention and treatment, abstinence, condom use. Test sexually active men and women once a year to rule out asymptomatic carriers. And the treatment is azithromycin, a single dose. What we have here is syphilis. This is the image that you're going to see. It was referred to as the great imitator because it can be confused with other diseases. The symptoms, a, a chancre. This is a hard chancre. That's what you see there. Fever, rash, stroke, nervous system deterioration. As you get into the later phases, you will actually have situations of this. And, and they had to actually put people in those situations before they had the treatments of uh, penicillin, et cetera. They had to put them into sanitariums because within 20 years, their minds started to literally deteriorate seriously. The organism is called Treponema palatum. It is a spirochete. Um, We'll get into table 27.9 in a second. This is the stages as you, as you hear of them. Uh, the primary stage, the spirochete penetrates the mucous membranes and abraded skin. Infectious dose is very, very low. It multiplies in localized areas to form the chancre, which you just saw. The chancre will disappear within two to six weeks, and there is some lymph node enlargement. The secondary stage is an asymptomatic period. Immune complexes will form rashes, aches, and pain occur. The tertiary stage, this is a massive immune reaction. 
small numbers of organisms that occur in heart, brain, eye abnormalities, general paresis, this is the personality changes, delusions, memory loss, impaired speech, hallucinations. Unfortunately, this can also get passed on to a child in utero, and this is referred to as congenital syphilis, and you have the birth defects. Hutchinson's teeth, these are notched and deformed teeth. Um, what you see up here, this mucosa patch is called a gumphus, okay? A uh, gumma. And here is another one. It's like an open sore, okay? Now, from here, this is what you see for the Hutchinson's teeth. They're notched, they're deformed teeth. Um, also, it's sad to report that... Um, what can lead onward, and this is again uh, Hutchison's teeth, if you have sexual contact with an infected partner and during the secondary stage, the kissing of the infected partner uh, can occur and they pick it up. So in other words, you can get this even if necessarily you're not having sexual intercourse. Um, Transplacental passage can lead to congenital syphilis, which I mentioned to you. One of the most famous cases of this is Beethoven. Beethoven's mom, um, her husband was syphilic and alcoholic, and they had the first child died of syphilis, was stillborn. Second was dying. Beethoven was born. He had deafness that eventually led to the destruction of his hearing later on in his life. These are the treponema palatum. You can see the spiraliness of it. And you see the primary, secondary, late, late, and tertiary. I do encourage you to review these, the stages of syphilis. Prevention and treatment condoms, treatment of sexual contacts, reporting of cases, and treatment of penicillin. In some cases, they don't even use penicillin. They use other antibiotics now. Um, there has not been as much reports of antibiotic resistance in the spirochetes, but it's believed that you really have to get to this before it becomes asymptomatic because then you're just, in essence, condemn condemning a sexual partner to a lot of uh, a shortened life with a lot of misery down the road. Let's move onward. The next you see is chancroid. It's a painful gradually enlarging soft shankers on or near the genitalia. Now, if you notice, there's one on the penis, but next to it, there is an opening there that's really, you have a large tender lymph node right nearby. The organism is Haemophilus ducreyi. It's a small pleomorphic gram-negative rod. And what you have there and there is another situation there. You have basically over here a huge inflamed lymph node. And then uh, you have these uh, soft shankers here around the penis. Now, um, although the pathogenesis, there is some incompleteness. Usually appears as a small pimple, which ulcerates and enlarges. Multiple lesions may, lesions may coalesce. Lymph nodes may enlarge and may discharge onto the skin surface. The epidemiology is usually sexual transmission, very common with sex workers, prostitutes, and helps to foster the spread of AIDS. Okay. How it does it is basically if you have punctures and damages to the skin, uh, any bleeding or fluid, bodily fluids can get transferred over into those wounded areas, and then you're going to the transfer of the virus as well as a transfer of some of the bacteria. The best prevention is abstinence. The treatment also means to avoid sexually promiscuous partners. Condoms are somewhat iffy. Several antibiotics for treatment, erythromycin, azithromycin, and cefotrexone. For the viral STIs, now, many viral STIs can reoccur for years while others can lead to cancer or AIDS. Genital herpes simplex, which you see there, and you see in the table 2712. Usually the symptoms are itching, burning pain at the site of the infection, painful urination, tiny blisters, 
with underlying redness. The blisters will break, leaving painful superficial ulcers that heal without scarring. Reoccurrences are common. Usually this is caused by herpes simplex type 2 virus. The herpes virus is enveloped double-stranded DNA. Due to modern sexual activity, as I said before, the HSV1 and HSV2 can be present in the genital regions. Pathogenesis. Lysis of the infected epithelial cells results in fluid-filled blisters containing infectious virions. Rupture of the blister leads to painful ulceration. Outbreak may occur later. The genome of the virus is present in sensory nerves. Newborns may contract fatal generalized herpetic infection if their mother has a primary infection at the time of the delivery. At present, there is no known animal reservoirs. Transmission by sexual intercourse, oral genital contact is usually the means. Transmission risk is greatest during the first few days of active disease. Transmission can occur in absence of symptoms. HSV increases the risk of contracting AIDS. Prevention and treatment, abstinence, condoms, monogamy. Spermicidal jellies and creams can inactivate HSV. And a cyclovir and famcyclovir can decrease severity of attacks. From here, we're going to move to the papillomaviruses. And what you see there are genital warts, warty outgrowths from the genital region. Papillomaviruses can also lead to cervical cancer, which is the abnormal cell growth in the cervix that may be invasive or fatal. The symptoms. Many infected individuals have no symptoms at all. Warts on the external or internal genitalia are most common. The high incidence of HPV and cervical cancer has been noted. Human papillomavirus is a non-enveloped, double-stranded DNA virus of the papilloma virus family. The pathogenesis is that the virus enters the epithelium through abrasions and infects deep layers of the epithelium, establish latency. Then you have cycles of replication occurring when host cells begin maturation. Cells associated with HPV, uh, excuse me, cancer associated with HPV genomes um, integrate into the host cell chromosome to cause the precancerous lesions. You can see uh, the abnormal cells there present. This is another image which you saw at the beginning of the chapter of papillomaviruses. So, what do we do? Well, unfortunately, Asymptomatic individuals can transmit the disease. 60% transmission with a single sexual contact. Warts can be transmitted to the mouth via oral sex and to newborn babies. Latex condoms are believed to minimize transmission, avoidance, with, avoidance of sexual contact with multiple sex partners. A pap test. Now, if you go back to page 751, they talk about this figure 2720. Basically, yearly for sexually active women, um, removal of precancerous lesions and warty growths may help, but do not necessarily cure infection as the infected cells may reside in latency. We'll get there in a second. <clears throat> now, imiquidmod is used to treat multiple external warts around the anus and external genitalia. Gardasil and Cerevex vaccines can protect against some HPV viral types. This must be stressed you can end up with a strange shift. Right now, some of the best uh, papillomavirus vaccines only protect against four strains. These are the most common. And the issue about strain shift could come down the road, which basically means that, okay, these are the most common viruses. They've been pretty much eradicated because our patients are vaccinated, but they can still come back and possibly have a papillomavirus-based infection from one of the other strains that were not previously common, but now are. And so there's an argument about the vaccination there. Now what we're gonna do is deal with HIV diseases and complications of immunodeficiency. Now, they used to literally have one whole chapter on this. That's what the author used to do, it's chapter 28. It's not there anymore, but I wanted to give you a lot of this information. It's very helpful and you'll see how it um, 
applies in other situations too. Immunodeficiency by terminology is the inability to produce normal immune response to an antigen. HIV disease implies that replication of the virus is causing symptoms or demonstrable damage to the body. HIV infection, the virus has entered the body and is replicating whether or not disease has occurred. AIDS, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, refers to the end stage of the HIV disease best characterized by unusual tumors and immunodeficiency. In HIV disease, the symptoms, no symptoms or flu-like symptoms early in the illness. A symptomatic period may last years. Immune systems slowly losing the battle against virus. Antibodies may take up to six months to appear. One of the first things that was occurring when we started having HIV outbreaks, they had a ELISA test that looked for antibodies but the antibodies did not show up for a while for people that were already infected. Hence, infected patients could be asymptomatic and have a clear test and remain sexually active and actually be infecting others. And that was one of the, the problems. The symptoms of lung, intestine, skin, eyes, brain, and other infections start appearing. Mostly, the, excuse me, most of these are opportunistic infections. About half develop fever, sore throat, head, and muscle aches, rash, and large lymph nodes early in the infection. Some subjects develop central nervous system symptoms ranging from moodiness and confusion to seizures and paralysis. These constitute ARC, acute retroviral syndrome, yet many symptoms are mild and are misattributed to the flu. After the asymptomatic period, symptoms of the persistent enlargement of the subject's lymph nodes occurs and this has been called lymph adenopathy syndrome. Now, I want you to note the map that you see here, 2721. You see here, basically, the uh, presence of HIV and whether there's been an increase and decrease between 20, 2001 and end of 2012. And what you see in some cases in some nations is an increase, others a decrease. But you need to be serious about this. Part of the numbers can get confused in part if the diagnostics are not accurate and if treatments are now being used and if the drugs are available. So I want you to keep that in mind as well. Okay. Now, you see here, the other symptoms indicating immunodeficiency, fever, weight loss, fatigue, diarrhea, these are referred to as AIDS-related complex, ARC, not to be confused with ARS, excuse me, acute retroviral syndrome. If you notice the progression here over years, first you have blood levels with a certain amount of HIV virus, the levels drop to a bit, you also have a latency of the CD4 lymphocytes and their levels progressively drop. Note the increased buildup over the period of time of circulating HIV RNA. Now, what's going on here? It takes much longer for some of the symptoms and for the virus to show up, for the antibodies to show up. And also the virus is sloppy it uses a, um, a reverse transcriptase because it is an RNA genome that then has to make DNA sequences that make more RNA copies as you start to make more copies of the virus. And what was happening was that the virus would get sloppy and you'd have a bunch of variations. And some of these variations would slip past the immune system. That's why it was so difficult to make a real vaccine for some time. And there's some hints that they may be making much more progress now. Human immunodeficiency virus is a retrovirus. It's a single-stranded RNA with an enzyme of reverse transcriptase found. Type 1 has many subtypes, and the major subtypes include M and O. HIV-2 which was mostly found in West Africa, 
and you can see some of this noted back here. Now, if you notice here, you've got several proteins and you've got this really complex virus. Um, it's an envelope virus. You have external receptors, glycoproteins, and a lot of these proteins were considered targets for um, vaccine production, but they weren't yielding the protection necessary. You see, the virus infects CD4 lymphocytes and macrophages. It destroys the ability to fight infections and cancers. Various HIV genes coded with the RNA genome play a role in viral replication as well as virion construction and release. HIV infects CD4 lymphocytes and antigen-presenting cells. These are the APCs. T cells are killed and the numbers slowly decline until the immune system can no longer resist infections or the development of tumors, okay? And you see some of the components here that make up the virus. Now note the lower ones, reverse transcriptase, integrase, and protease. These are gonna be the drug targets. And that's the key point I'm trying to get you to understand. If they can't work with the outside of the virus, they may be able to work with the process of how the virus replicates itself and stop replication. Okay, CD4 is a cell surface antigen. It's present on macrophages, dendritic cells, and T cells. Okay, those that are not destroyed by the virus, the macrophages and dendritic cells, become in essence the reservoir for the virus by releasing the virus from the cells for a long period of time, as well as acting as a carrier of the virus into the brain. HIV switches its genetic affinity from CD4, along with the co-receptor CCR5, to using CXCR4 and CCR5 alone in the brain. And they get you confused. Think of these as receptors on the outside of the cell. So once it gets transported to the cell, uh, to the brain, then you really got problems because now HIV is infecting macrophages and microglii. And this will act to alter neuron cell and astrocyte function, leading to HIV dementia and lethargy. The virus infects intestinal epithelium and lymphoid tissue, which possibly contributes to the chronic diarrhea and weight loss. Okay. So there's all your targets. Intestinal epithelium, CD4 cells. And you can see how it attaches here using a co-receptor, attachment co-receptor, and then fusion. That bullet part in here contains all the essential information and tools, proteins, necessary to start replication inside of the cell. And once this occurs, it will also hide, if necessary, as a provirus inside of the cell's chromosome. If it doesn't, then it will make lots and lots of cells and eventually destroy the cell. Okay. HIV is present in blood, semen, and vaginal secretions in symptomatic and asymptomatic carriers. It's spread by sharing infected needles, sexual intercourse, passed from mother to child during childbirth. Abstinence from sexual intercourse, drug abuse, and monogamy have been found helpful. Anti-HIV medications to expectant mothers and their newborn infants has been useful. Uh, reverse transcriptase inhibitors and protease inhibitors in combination. This is where we're going to get into heart. The highly active antiretroviral therapy. It's a cocktail of reverse transcriptase inhibitors and protease inhibitors. You see the anti-HIV medications and cesarean section have also been found to decrease mother to newborn transmission. Okay. Entry inhibitors. Well, these block the access to the co-receptor CCR5 or prevent fusion of the viral envelope with the host cell envelope. Integrase inhibitors. These prevent integration of the virus DNA copy with the host cell genome. Now, you notice the chart here, uh, table 2716, people at increased risk for HIV. Just keep in mind that one of the, the issues that used to occur during the 80s was people that were getting blood transfusions and blood transfusions were either from blood donations or 
blood products and these products were usually taking large amounts of pooled blood extracting from them the um, clotting factors necessary for those that were hemophilic so for a period of time hemophilics were a subpopulation that was getting hiv for nothing else than the fact that they were needing the blood clotting factors that their bodies would not produce you notice the deaths as we've been using um the heart therapy it has led to a serious decline in the number of deaths due to hiv and these are the various antiviral medications the two biggies are the integrase inhibitors and the protease inhibitors Keep in mind that the virus produces a multi-gene uh, uh, um, mRNA, and as a result, you get this very long piece that has to have this peptide clipped up into several different active uh, proteins. If you have the protease inhibitors, you're not going to have that. The virions will not mature, and so the viruses stop their replication and destruction of all the other cells. Here are some of the early, um, basically, reverse transcriptase inhibitors, and the best one was AZT. And, of course, here are some of the different behaviors that help to reduce the incidence of HIV transmission. Okay. Now, there are some protein, a, protein inhibitors, protease inhibitors that block the viral protease from cleaving the polyprotein. This polyprotein contains such proteins as GAG and Paul protein for functional products. What it was found is that every time that they had a reverse transcriptase inhibitor, within a certain period of time, sometimes a year, sometimes 16 months, sometimes 18 months, the high mutation rate or the uh, error rate produced by the reverse transcriptase would eventually lead to the formation of a strain of HIV that was resistant. So you had one drug after another drug after another. But somebody then said, well, why don't we combine them all? Because if you're having one resistance, you couldn't get like several different mutations all at the same time to provide the multi-drug resistance. And that plus the protease inhibitors, the cocktail, as they called it, could lead to real hope for these patients. And that's why a lot of them are alive today. Okay. Opportunistic infections and, and tumors due to HIV infection. And what you got to keep in mind is this, malignant tumors. These tumors can arise from the immunodeficiency status due to HIV, but you can have other immunodeficiency situations, such as organ transplant or other immune compromised situations. What we're going to first deal with is malignant tumors that pop up. That includes Karposky sarcoma, B lymphocytic tumors of the brain, usually caused by Epstein Barr virus. There's also a symptom of that. You can see it, hairy leukoplakey. I've got a, a case of that, uh, a picture of that. And then, of course, you're going to have cervical and anal carcinomas. Then we're going to deal with the infectious complications. This is why we have to know the immune status of our patients if we use a vaccine. Is the vaccine attenuated? Or is it a dead virus or a viral component? Strongyloides stericoticus, this is a helminth parasite. They can crawl up through the skin, et cetera. They usually will build up in the lungs, et cetera, with immunosuppressed patients. And then, of course, penicillin marfietti, uh, which is a mold. The other in, in infectious complications, when you have immunosuppression, you have the possibility of tuberculosis. Pneumonia, this is the fungi I talked about before. Toxoplasmosis of protozoan, cytomegalovirus disease, which is a virus. And then, of course, mycobacterium diseases. This is where you're going to get mycobacterium avum complex. And I'll talk all about these as we move forward. First, let's deal with Karposky sarcoma. Now, Karposky sarcoma you have unusual tumors arising from the blood and lymphatic vessels in multiple locations. Causative agent is human herpes virus 8. HHV8 infects endothelial cells that line blood and lymphatic vessels, remains latent for the most part. Cell change into spindle-shaped tumor cells. 
and then they will eventually proliferate, as well as extensive formation of new blood vessels will occur. This was formerly considered a unique disease in older men in, uh, of Mediterranean East European origin and in Northern Africa. The instance has re been reduced in light of safe sex practices. The next one, B lymphocytic tumors of the brain. This is where you get malignant tumors arising from lymphoid cells, usually B lymphocytes, sometimes T lymphocytes. The lymph node enlargement occurs. The HIV infection may activate a latent EBV infection, Epstein-Barr virus infection, of the B cell and lead to polyclomal B cell proliferation. In other words, all these different types of B cells will suddenly start popping up. But Epstein-Barr plays a role. And usually lymphomas rarely arise in the brain except in AIDS patients. There is no evidence of involvement with sexual transmitted infection. Also, another EBV-related symptom is hairy leukoplakia. Now, hairy leukoplakia of the mouth is an unusual form of leukoplakia. It is seen only in people who are infected with HIV, have AIDS, or AIDS-related complex. It consists of a fuzzy, hence the name hairy, white patches on the tongue, and less frequently elsewhere in the mouth due to keratin projections. It is the mouth's reaction to chronic irritation of the mucous membranes of the mouth. It is associated with EBV, and tissue samples demonstrate EBV DNA and Epstein-Barr uh, virus antigens present. Hairy leukoplakia requires treatment with an antiviral medication, acyclovir, valcyclovir, famcyclovir, ganglocyclovir, or foscarnet. Okay? Now, uh, we also have, oh, and I'm sorry, I had the pictures wrong. This is an example of Karposki sarcoma, and you can see it. They look like blisters but or, or, or bloody, uh, almost like bruises, but you notice they're raised up here, and this is just bunching up and of uh, the uh, blood vessels. Okay. Cervical anal sarcoma. We, we haven't gotten to those other infections here. This is cancerous growth of the anus or uterine cervix. It's usually caused by human papillomavirus types 16 and 18. The HPV infects the epithelial cells of the cervix and anal region. HPV is transmitted during sexual activity. HPV uh, appears through blot genes responsible for controlling cell replication. HPV replication increases as the host system, immune system weakens. The incidence increases with risky behavior. Men who engage in anal sex or women who engage in anal intercourse must be regularly screened for this particular symptom. Now let's talk about infectious complications. Basically, I've mentioned this before, and you can go back to page 460, table 18.3. Most attenuated vaccines are unsafe for HIV subjects. Dead or component vaccines made of a lipo, uh, polyliposaccharide or cell protein component like you would have with, with uh, hepatitis B, these are advised to be given as soon as the HIV is diagnosed. Many diseases that pose no threat to normal people can cause severe, even fatal infections in subjects with impaired immune systems. And I mentioned to you also other life-threatening infections, the strongyloides stericotis, the penicillin mafioli, and also, if tuberculosis is dormant, it can be reactivated and become infectious as the patient becomes immunocompromised. It's very, very common for HIV patients to suddenly have, wait a minute, I got tuberculosis also? Why? They've been fighting it all their life. They may have actually had a small case of it, but it was all bundled up and protected into this nodule. But once the immune system starts falling apart, the tuberculosis is let to run rampant. And it's very common to see patients with both HIV and tuberculosis, especially in the later stages. Okay? Uh, let's move to pneumocystosis pneumonia. Now, as I mentioned to you before, I dealt with this with respiratory system infections. This was formerly known as pneumocystis coronae. It is now known as pneumocystis gyrovecchi. This is, was first thought to be um, protozoal, but we now really know it's fungal. So this is another situation where patients, because of the, the uh, weakened immune system, because of HIV, this is another common infection they can get. Next one, toxoplasmosis uh, gandhi. 
this is a situation now we're going to deal with this when we talk about uh, chapter 26 nervous system infections okay so i'll just be brief about it this is a protozoal infection and you will see this popping up very commonly the thing with individuals that have hiv or other immunosuppression is that you will have to ask them do you have cats and do you handle a litter box because it's entirely possible that they may have already been exposed to this and as their immune systems continue to go downward, the toxoplasmosis will begin to make itself present. The next one is cyclomegalovirus disease. As you can see here, here's the diagram of the transmission of toxoplasmosis. Cyclomegalovirus. This is sad. Like many other herpes virus, this virus is acquired early in life and remains late unless the immune system is weakened. Then the infection activates and causes severe symptoms. Um, the symptoms include infection in mother can result in disease in the newborn. Immunocompromised individuals can experience blindness, lethargy, dementia, coma, brain damage. Cytomegalovirus is a member of the herpes virus family. Cytomegalo derives from the fact that infected cells are two or more times the size of uninfected cells. If you look there, you're going to see these big cells here amidst the other cells, and they look like owl eyes, okay? Um, what happens is usually the cells will fuse together. Many tissues are susceptible to infection, eyes, brain, liver. Once latent cells are reactivated, the virions are produced and the tissue becomes necrotic. If CMV infected T cell is infected with HIV, production of CMV virions will occur. CD4 plus T lymphocyte count is depressed and thus can enhance the HIV disease. What about the epidemiology? CMV is present across the world. Infection is lifelong. Body fluids, breast milk, blood, urine, semen, vaginal secretions can transmit the disease. Almost all prostitutes and promiscu promiscuous homosexual men are infected with CMV. There is no vaccine available. So prevention and treatment is basically, uh, you, you really have to have blood and tissue transplants to be tested for CMV before given to a patient that is CMV negative. CMV negative individuals must wash hands following contact with body fluids and avoid daycare centers. The treatment is ganglocyclovir and foscarinet. Next, mycobacterium diseases. Oh, by the way, this is uh, cytomegalovirus retinitis where you can see it's doing damage to the tissue and you can actually see the subsequent uh, retin, retinal bleeding. Okay, here we go. Mycobacteria diseases. This is a bacteria. And this is also referred to as MAC disease or Mycobacterium avium complex. It, you know, pr as previously discussed, the tuberculosis is caused by Mycobacterium tuberculosis and it can re remain latent as it is under the control of immune system because we have tubercles but it can become again active as the hiv patient's immune system falters but you can also have other mycobacterium that can cause illness especially with hiv patients and mac is asymptomatic in healthy people some children develop asymptoma asymptomatic chronic enlargement, or excuse me, asymmetrical chronic enlargement of the lymph nodes of the neck that is treated with surgical removal. In the elderly, this can cause chronic cough. Now, in patients with immunodeficiencies, cough, fever, sweating, marked weight loss, abdominal pain, and diarrhea can occur. The causative agent is a Mycobacterium avum species, and there's also some species of Mycobacterium intracellular. The bacteria enter the body via the lungs or gastrointestinal tract and are taken up by macrophages. In healthy patients, the bacteria are destroyed by the macrophages and by cellular immunity. In the immunocompromised patient, though, the bacteria multiply inside the macrophages, are transported throughout the body. The bacteria grow to large numbers in the tissues, but little or no inflammatory reactions will occur. Now, the organisms are widespread. They're in soil, water, food, dust. MAC disease in immunodeficient patients can occur via environmental sources or activation of a latent infection. 
there have been no proven measures to prevent exposure to the bacteria. Prevention to immunocompromised patients is use of clathromycin. If MAC bacteremia occur, occurs by uh, use of two or more drugs, such as uh, clathromycin and ethambutical are used. Okay, so if you really have the bacteremia existing, that's what I'm trying to say, and it's in the blood, then you have to use two or more drugs. And two of them right off the bat are clathromycin and ethambutical. Okay, let's go to the next one. What we're going to start focusing on is protozoal STDs, which is kind of winding down the entire lecture, but hang in there. We're almost done. Now, you got to be aware of this. For protozoal STDs, giardiitis, entamoeba histolytica, cryptosporidiosis can be passed by individuals. Fecal to oral, normally, especially if they engage in oral, genital, or anal contact during the sexual activity. Trichomyiasis, well, that's a little bit more common. For women, the symptoms include itching, burning, swelling, vaginal redness, frothy, sometimes smelly yellow-green discharge and burning during urination. For men, discharge from the penis, burning during urination, painful testes, and tender prostate. Some women and men are asymptomatic. Now, you can see what this is. Notice it has an undulating, in other words, a wavy membrane that allows it to transport, it will have anterior flagella and what's called an axial style. Notice where the nucleus is. So they kind of wave along as they move by. There are some other important things to keep in mind. Here is a comparable size of T. vaginalis and a polymorphic nuclear leukocyte. Okay. And you can see this for a size comparison. <clears throat> Trichomonas vaginalis has four anterior flagella. It has a posterior flagella attached to an undulating membrane. Now, here's the difference, though. It has no mitochondria, but it has these hydro hydrogenosomes, which are present. These components, organelles, help convert pyruvate to hydrogen gas. This accounts for the frothy symptom that you see. Although the pathogen pathogenesis is uncertain, Vulva or vaginal walls are going to become red and slightly swollen. Inflammatory changes and pinpoint hemorrhages suggest mechanical trauma from the motile organism. Epidemiologically, this is in worldwide distribution, and the biggest problem is asymptomatic carriers will foster the spread. Now, these organisms are easily killed by drying due to the lack of, of cis form. So basically, if it comes outside the body, it has no cyst stage, they're easily to dry. So the transmission to effectively infect someone else is primarily intimate contact. Now, newborns can acquire infection from mother at birth. Um, there are some very limited treatments. There is the treatment of metrodiazinol for an antimicrobial anti agent. Uh, the preventions include abstinence, monogamy, and condoms. And that's about it for this lecture. This seemed to be a lot, but I encourage you to take the time to review this content. It will be very relevant for you as healthcare providers in the future. Also, I encourage you to take time to review at the end the microassessment, the future opportunities. The diseases in review. Now, keep in mind, I added a few things here, so you want to be able to be on top of that, too. And then, of course, also the chapter summary. This will get you in final preparations for the upcoming last exam. We have one more lecture to go, and after that, we're done. Have a great day.